Well, thank you guys for, and girls for coming to the session this afternoon. I know there have been a, a fair number of ones earlier, learn about all sorts of cool Samsung technology. Uh, session right before this, I learned that my veins are unique. So at least I have one good learning from the conference. Uh, how many of you here are interested in making more money? Yes? Okay. If you're not interested in making more money, there's other sessions that are probably way better for you. So that's all we're going to cover here is how to make, your, with your apps, making money. So if you're somebody who's an engineer who just wants to make the absolute coolest thing ever, other sessions. This is for people that want to increase the revenue. There's going to be two parts of the presentation. The first part is going to be how to make more money tomorrow. Then that second part is going to be a potential business model that we see emerging uh, coming out of Middle East and Southeast Asia. So it's more of a heads up on what you're going to be seeing in the next year or so. As I mentioned before, I'm Jake Hoskins. I run business development for Fortumo. Who's Fortumo? Great question. So what we do is we provide carrier billing in emerging markets. So very similar to the folks that were up here before, Braintree. Braintree does credit cards. We do carrier billing. So it's a very similar payment processing technology. We've been around since 07, back before Android was cool. Uh, we specialize in carrier billing, and we provide it in 80 countries. So the data I'm presenting is from my servers. We pulled it down, crunched it. So this is actual developer data that your peers have contributed to our sets. Uh, so there'll be no personally identifiable information from developer or users, but this is aggregated. We have offices in San Francisco, Estonia, where's our headquarters, as well as Beijing, Shanghai, and New Delhi. Our team is over 70 people. About half of that's engineering, and half are BD folks like myself. And we're backed by Intel Capital. Uh, put together a nice little logo cloud that's obligatory. This isn't everybody we do business with. This is where I could stop fitting them on the slide. So in essence, we're like Switzerland. We do business with everybody. And we want all app manufacturers to make more money. So this is the opportunity. I mean, I'm an American. I'm from San Francisco. We get rather caught up in ourselves. We love San Francisco unique things like paying people to sit in parking meters for you. This isn't about that either. This is about what people can afford who are getting their first smartphones, who have jobs in Brazil and Thailand. So as you can see here, China is adding the most new phones. Uh, you're at the Samsung conference because they're selling a lot of phones. <laughs> And so a lot of these uh, new 700 some odd million new smartphone users are going to be buying Samsungs. As, as you see here, India, 200 million. That's crazy. They're adding almost as many new phone owners as we have phone owners in the US. And this is going to be each year for the next couple years. And same thing once you start aggregating regions like Latin America and Africa. US, we're here as number three. I was personally surprised to see that there's 47 million new people with smartphones, but I guess between the tweens and the senior citizens, it's 47 million. Uh, other markets of note are Indonesia. That is a really great market of ours. As we can see, as these folks are getting their first phones, and primarily it's their first communication device, they are jumping right in. They're, going, they're skipping the TV, they're skipping the desktop PC, and this is their first computing device. This isn't news to anybody, but just thinking about how the services they're going to consume are on these. Here are the download charts. Uh, I think if you're up here, you have to do an app Annie chart. It's the rules. So here's my app Annie chart. Uh, good folks also from San Francisco. On the left, you see the downloads. How many of you have India in your top five of places that download your app? Yeah, that's it. OK. How many of you have India in your top five revenue? Two. Two. That's solid. But you can see here from the typical charts from App Annie, most of the revenue is coming from you know, US, Japan, South Korea. Uh, China is not listed here just due to a quirk of their data set, but China would be there as well. Probably number one. Uh, but I'll get to China a little bit later. It is a very unique market, and I'll have some uh, advice as to how to approach it. Perfect. The China slide. So earlier, we have, as I mentioned, we have two offices in China. I was at China Joy this summer, and this is a very unscientific sample of what China Joy is like. 
The short of it is these guys have pirate ships. They sell so many apps they can afford pirate ships at a B2B show. Why? Because they're making a ton of money. Uh, so the, my advice to you is unless you have a very unique circumstance, avoid highly competitive markets. So there's firms that are ginormous in China that are making a lot of money in the market. They specialize in that. They have pirate ships and even better booths. This was just the one across from ours. Avoid Korea. It's very difficult for kind of new guys to make money there because it's so developed and there's so much money flowing through it. The big guys are paying attention. Same thing with Japan. So those are three markets I would encourage you to uh, leave to the existing players and don't consider them to be emerging markets that are accessible for you. And so the other thing, advice that we see for our successful clients is don't fight this guy. This guy's really good. He's, he's a mean CPI player. He's a really mean monetization player. So unless you are, have the business side tuned up, so that means that you need to have a state-of-the-art user acquisition team. You know, full PhDs, big cash and money to go out and spend, buy different ad networks, um, optimizing, it's tough. You only have about 25 people or developers that are of scale to do this in the big leagues. Similarly, on the monetization side, you need to have all the mechanics that they have. You need to have back office, live ops. Very difficult to compete with them. Uh, and they pay attention, obviously, to the biggest markets because they're big machines that need to have big markets to keep growing. So the advice here is avoid really strong competitors and go where they're not paying attention today. Here is the emerging markets revenue equation. Uh, I'm not a developer. So if you have any really detailed questions, please email them to me and I will check. I am a finance guy though, so I love equations. And here it is for emerging markets. It's important and it's different than the US. Distribution, how am I, am I getting my apps out to people that live in Brazil and Indonesia and Africa and Saudi Arabia? It's different, you just can't toss it into Google Play and forget about it because Google Play is not in all those places. Then you have to think about how am I driving somebody to hit the pay point? So this is your traditional game design and it's somewhat similar to where you would see in the US, but you need to make sure that your value proposition is there. So that includes localizing. So if I don't speak English and your app's only in English, probably not gonna pay for it. Uh, are you charging me the right point? Am I hooked enough? And then you also think your payment conversion. So right now in the US, uh, Google and Apple and Microsoft take care of that for you. Everybody has a credit card. Uh, I'd argue my wife has too many. So that's the problem Americans have are too many credit cards and, and Braintree is happy to process those for you. But in emerging markets, they don't have them. Especially don't have the international credit cards that uh, some of the firms say, we accept credit cards in 287 countries. Yeah, you accept Goldman Sachs bankers credit cards in 287 countries. That's not your customer. So you have to think about how you're gonna get paid. And then the other thing that changes in each of these markets are your transaction costs. It's not just straight 30. It's gonna vary depending upon how you process your transaction. And I'll get into that in a little bit later slide. So the keys to success, understand the local markets. It's not really a build a global app and for set it, forget it. So look at the trends that are local to the market. So you're targeting Brazil with a cricket app. I would say rethink your strategy. You're targeting Pakistan with a cricket app. You're gonna have some com competition, but at least you're selling them something they want. Distribution. Think about how you're going to reach the users. It's not Google Play and forget it. Hit the pay point. See, this lines up to the equation. Uh, you have to make sure that it's worth paying for. And it's worth paying for in local currency. Nobody wants to pay you in dollars because when you go other places, they're not really excited to accept one dollar from you. Similarly, they don't want to pay you one dollar. So these are three of the local markets I'm gonna go through today. If you have questions on other markets, we have similar data to be happy to share. Just shoot me an email and I can send over what other aggregate data we have. Uh, we're gonna talk about our big three. So Southeast Asia is our number one region. Our customers make the most money there. Latin America, close second. And then India is where we process the highest number of transactions in the world. Here's Thailand as an example country in uh, Southeast Asia. So other ones here would be you know, Indonesia, Malaysia. So these are the carriers we do business with in Thailand, just listed them. And those are Thai bot. 
here you can see that the Thai buy at lots of different price points. So you can charge them up to $479, which $159 bought, all the way down to $20 or so, and still make money. So you have to think about where your strategy is and where you want to come into the pricing scheme. So is the, are you selling a sword? Are you selling a brighter flashlight? Whatever your app is, make sure to test on a market basis because there is no one right global price. If you say, I'm 99 cents worldwide, you are leaving money on the table left and right. So make sure to test in at local markets to optimize, just because even if your good is the same worldwide, and even if their purchasing power is similar, they might value it differently. So social apps and um, social gaming are a big category of ours. And we see the Brazilians will pay top dollar for social gaming. They like it. Uh, versus we, those got same people need to lower their prices in Indonesia. Here is Latin America. And when I say the target, that means that if you have a, a well thought out app that is localized in many places. And so this would be our better customers. They think, how am I going to localize into my key regions? And I'm picking maybe 10 different to localize into. So if you're doing about 15% of your revenue in Latin America, you're in a good spot. If you're at 1%, you're underweight and probably even money on the table, unless you're cricket, in which case you should expect that, or NFL, something like that. Here you can see that the Brazilians, they don't like to pay the 9.99 price point. Uh, only 7% of our transactions are there. However, at the lower price points, the equal, there's equal money at the 5.72 and 8.85. I'm sorry, 2.85. One of the reasons you see here is that we have distinct price points is a quirk of carrier billing. So credit cards are continuous. You can charge whatever you like. You can charge 23 cents. You can charge 187. Carriers only have a distinct number, so each country has between three to five price points, and so you have to fit into the bucket. The way that our users adjust the amount of that people get sticking with just a five is you can offer different conversion rates to gold in your game. So if you want to drop the price of gold, you can say rather than getting 10 gold pieces for 285, you get 20. And so that changes the in-game economics for you a little bit. India. This is a, probably our most different market and the market that I see my customers making the most mistakes in. Here, if it's not 10 rupees, it's not selling. So you need to make sure that you have a product that is good for 10. But the trick is to ask, so what's not quite clear on this graphic is that a lot of those are repeat purchases. So they ask for 10 rupees every couple days. So if you want 100 rupees, you have to ask 10 times. Don't ask once. If you ask once, you don't get to move any volume. So you have to rework your mechanics to ask smaller, more frequently, because the Indians will only load about 50 rupees onto their cards at any given time. So a relatively small number of them will have the 69 that if you want to ask for. Versus he'll say, yeah, I'll go and I'll top up a day early if you ask me for 10. I can do that. So those are some local tricks we see. Uh, also in the markets, you need to think about your promotion strategy. So in the US, you say, hey, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, great, I'm done. You need to think about what are the local communication networks. So look at Twitter, they make a lot of data available. Where are they big? Uh, if you're in Indonesia, path, it's huge. You can't be an Indonesian and not have path, you're not a cool guy. So if your app's going to go big there, you need to think about what's your path strategy. And they have similar ones in Russia and, and different regions. So spend time, figure out where the communications networks are that your users are using in the target regions, and make sure that you're hooked in there. So it's a little bit more work. You might say to yourself, wow, all this work sounds hard, like a business. Yes, making money is hard and it is a business. But those same things that make it hard for you means that the lazy developer sitting over in the next room isn't doing that. They have the 99 cent English app and you're gonna crush them and take the money before they figure out what happened. This is an example of distribution. Uh, Samsung apps is on. Uh, obviously, if you have a Samsung phone, you get the apps. But there's a lot of other ones as well. So you know your Mobo Genies, your carrier stores. Uh, in China, for example, they have about a dozen stores of really big size. And these stores are moving beyond China into Southeast Asia. So we're seeing the trends are moving. And the Chinese are expanding from China, a very competitive market, into Southeast Asia, into Latin America. And so you have to be aware of how they're getting distribution. These stores are coming preloaded on second and third tier phones, which will not be named here, but they're not as cool as Samsung's, 
but they may be potentially more affordable. And that's what you're looking for if you're on a more restricted income. You're thinking, what sort of phone can I get for 50 bucks? Not my uh, awesome phone. Localization, it's not the end of it, but it's a good start. Only about 10% of people speak good English. I've seen estimates of up to 20%, a little bit of English. But you're still talking about 80% of your potential customers no English. So design with that in mind. Know the languages that you're going to move into. So Spanish, Portuguese. Uh, you can get French. We'll cover a lot of Africa for you. Arabic, Russian. Those are good ones. And then I would pick a few Southeast Asian languages, you know, Thai, Indonesian, Vietnamese, and pick that. And if you pick your Indonesian example, make sure you do PATH. Don't say I'm localizing into Indonesian and not have PATH. So make logical choices between your localization and your social hookups and your advertising strategy and promotion strategy. Uh, here's one of uh, my favorite games of yore. They did a great job here. Uh, my, I hand this game to my kids, and they can play it, and they're both illiterate. And so they can just swing it back and shoot them. It's great. They don't have to understand it because you know, we forget in English, we assume everybody speaks English. But you're illiterate in every language except for a handful that you speak. And so by having somebody that's illiterate uh, check your apps, we find that that's a good strategy to make sure it's workable. The same way as uh, you know, kids can swipe and understand how to use photo viewing apps, if a kid can use your app and really get a good understanding or a nod native speaker can use it, that's a great way to check, am I localized enough? So if you have a text adventure, that's harder. But if your game is more graphical, make sure that it's friendly to non-native speakers. As I was mentioning before, so this was a slide I actually had trouble creating. Uh, at other conferences, they might have phones other than Samsungs. But at a Samsung conference, do you say that phones that aren't particularly awesome are Samsungs or other brands? Who think I did the right thing by putting Samsung? No. Oh, okay. So I have an awesome phone. My phone costs $600. Your customer, and you probably have awesome phones. Guarantee it. None of you are probably sitting with a $50 phone in your pocket. Any? We have you have $50 phone? All right, we have a test engineer with a $50 phone. He, all right, we have two guys whose phones are crappy. <laughs> they sit up there, which is good because they're in the, learning how to make more money. And so you have to design. I, I know that this is a little bit against what you're hearing from the App Store manager. So to be featured, you have to use the absolute latest and greatest SDKs and do the vein detection and use all the latest hardware, and that'll get you featured and get you rich. That's the, the pitch that the App Stores make for you. Great, do that. But make sure that it, when it doesn't have those high specs, that it's still worth paying for. Because if you have to have the absolute latest and greatest to be worth paying for, your user's not going to hit the pay point under the mindset that I'm going to pay you because this game is awful without a six inch beautiful screen. So design to a lower spec if you want to make more money outside of the US and Western Europe. So these are the three kind of groupings of countries. We do business in 80 countries and these are uh, kind of a representative nine. So on the top, Western Europe, they behave very similarly to the US as far as pricing. So don't charge the Germans any less. Uh, although we do a good business in Germany because they're scared of putting their credit cards on the internet. They think we're spying on them. Where'd they get that idea? So lucky for me, but as far as action items for you, just keep pricing it the same as you would to the Americans. Our merchants actually are making the most money in the second bucket. So the Brazils, Taiwans, Malaysias, um, Thailand would go there. And this is where you're charging average transactions of two bucks but you're hitting them up multiple times. So you can see here the Brazilians are doing it on average twice and the Melee are five times. So you have to think about how do I make my game so that there's a reason to pay more than once. So if you're just doing a one and done unlock to play, count on getting two. Versus if you have a game dynamic where they're buying new levels or some sort of added value more frequently, that's where you can rack up to get up to the average revenue per paying user per month. And then in the lower countries, uh, lower price countries, Vietnam, China, and India, think about much higher transaction velocity. So how do I get my Indian customer to pay me every couple of days? 10 rupees. Don't think about how do I make my product so awesome it's worth 100. 
think about how I make it so awesome it's worth 100, I charge 10, and I keep giving that experience over and over again that he keeps paying for. So gonna do a quick summary around the cost. Remember the equation, so you have to get distribution, so the alternative app stores. You have to drive them to the pay point and make it worthwhile, and you have to get the pricing levels right. This is that minus part. So the sad news about the minus is you have to pay it. Uh, the good news is you get to keep the other half of that. So this is all found money, because if you're not doing it, someone else is getting it. So in credit cards, this would be the brain trees and stripes of the world. Take commissions in the 5% ballpark. Uh, and about a billion and a half people have credit cards. So I'm in that billion, you're in that billion. Uh, most people that live in Thailand are not there. Almost no Indians are there, except for our friendly Goldman bankers of India. They have low conversion because when you type on, oops, I guess not there. You can see it's hard to put in your information into the credit card form. That doesn't look very much fun, especially when you have a low quality small screen. Try typing your name and your phone number and your mother's maiden name and your dog's pet. All of that tough. So you have a tough conversion. Good news is you get to keep almost all of the money because of low commission. Carrier billing, this is what we do. Our claim to fame is conversion. We are the best in the world at getting high conversion. Uh, the downside of that is on, you're, the carriers know this. Uh, not as bad as the old wall garden days where you know, two thirds was a starting point, but they're still keeping between 15 to, 15 to 50 percent of the funds. So if you charge 10 rupees, the Indian carriers will keep half for their troubles and give you five. That's why it's a volume business. Their position is, if you didn't have me, you wouldn't have five. So it's uh, back and forth. The rates are getting better, but they're not ever going to be at the 5% because the carriers have a higher cost of funds that they have to pay. So in Latin America, you have a lot of prepaid anywhere there's prepaid, and you have maybe a 20% channel fee. So they're only getting 80 cents on the dollar themselves, so they could never pay out more than that. Uh, here you can see our, our little conversion window. You just click accept and buy, and then we send silent technology in the background and debit it from either their prepaid or postpaid account. Good news is every single human can pay you. That's pay you and pay you easily and pay you fast. But you pay on the other side as far as the payment processing fee. E-wallets. Uh, can't be in China. So I told you to avoid China, but if your apps happen to end up there, Alipay is a good way to go. Uh, PayPal. So Alipay, those guys have about a billion total, uh, and there's other ones in Russia. Lower fees, flexible pricing, but they already have to have a wallet. And if somebody doesn't have a wallet, this is not helpful. So it's limited reach. Uh, unless you're in special situations, it should probably not be your number one uh, payment option. It should be a secondary. Next steps. So this is what you should do tomorrow if you want to go make more money. Think about where your app's doing well. So look at your existing download statistics. Use your kind of thought process and say, hey, is my app a good fit in these regions? So if your whole app is about designing bikinis, don't pick Saudi Arabia. Your app will be rejected. Uh, we had a very cool app that uh, dealt cards with bikini girls, and it was rejected in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so pick your markets, be understanding about local customs, and target, be specific. Just don't throw it out there. Say, I'm going to go after these markets, and I'm going to do a good job with my pricing. Tuning your app. So this would be pricing, localization, and then adjusting your pricing so that way you fit. So don't be charging 100 rupees in India. And I can give you specific pricing advice in other markets uh, other than listed here. Just shoot me an email. Any questions on this part of the presentation? Yeah. Question is, what is the chargeback rate? So with credit cards, it can be rather high. Uh, I'm not an expert on the credit card side. You can ask the Braintree guys out in the pavilion. On the carrier billing, it's less than 1%. So it's not a big factor because the carriers uh, take a different view of customer service than perhaps they, uh, other people would. And so you make a charge, you made a charge. Uh, so as a merchant, that's good. Yeah, question? Yeah, the question is, how long will it take to get your money from when the charge happened? So this is an area where carriers are not uh, as awesome as credit cards. So they range globally from one month in parts of Eastern Europe where they appreciate the speed of a dollar, uh, all the way to seven months 
uh, you can thank the Saudis again. Uh, it's good if you have oil underneath you, you can pay in seven months. On average, it's three to four. Yeah? So the question is, based on the distribution, uh, alternative distribution, is it the same sort of whale economics as you would typically see? So in general, um, our economics are about a third of the revenue comes from one-time guys, a third comes from two to five, and a third from more than five payments. So it's flatter than it is in the U.S. Yeah, the question is for physical goods and services, are the carriers more reasonable about their fee structures? Um, they say that they are, but then when the rubber hits the road, it's 15 to 50. So I would encourage if you're selling a sofa to use Braintree. There's not yet an efficient way to remotely sell a sofa to an Indian without using a credit card. Any other questions on the first part, how to make money tomorrow? Awesome. So everybody's going to do this, right? You should. The, the money is there, and as soon as Google Play expands into these markets uh, in a big way with carrier billing, that's when the kings of the world are going to come in and you know, suck the money out. So prior to Google Play's expansion is when mid-sized and smaller developers have an opportunity to really go in and make a difference and get a foothold before the hyper-competitive forces come in and make it a less appealing market. All right, time for another oh, question. So the question is, does carrier billing accept money in and out like a PayPal would, or is it just pay out? Right now, it is just pay from the user to the developer. Uh, there's no peer-to-peer -peer paying on the carrier side, because then you get into different money laundering and regulations that the carriers do not want to mess around with. Nobody wants to finance terrorism or have to prove that they're not. Uh, so another vote. So that's the today, tomorrow portion. This is going to be the, where do we see the industry going in the next couple years? And we've heard some whispers coming out of some of the more uh, innovative carriers, and this is what they're telling us. So if you want to interested in what's going to happen in the next two or three years, this would be the part of the presentation. If it's not uh, that is part of presentation, you can go do something else. Quick vote. How many of you guys think that the current era of shareware is going to persist forever? So free to play, also known as shareware. Back in the day, it was called shareware. So who thinks, who, who has done shareware or free to play? We're selling it, but we're not buying it? All right, half the room says they've done free-to-play. Uh, personally, I used to like to pay for software. So I hope that shareware is not the end of the road for our industry, because with shareware, you're optimizing around acquisition and monetization. Notice I did not say fun. I feel like I have a friend that works at a grocery store. It's probably the only picture of a tomato at Samsung Developer Conference. So I have a friend that works at a grocery store, uh, he's a, a buyer, and he says that this is what they look for when they buy tomatoes. It needs to be very red. If it's not red, nobody will buy it. Durable. Let's stack these things 10 high. And they need to be long-lasting because I don't want to have to throw away my inventory. Did he say taste? No. There was no taste. They don't care what they taste like. And so they're not optimizing around it. And I see a very clear parallel with our industry is are we optimizing around fun? Are we optimizing around the UA and conversion? Uh, in my prior role, I worked at a company where we had 97% of our brain juices were flowing towards our conversion funnel, and our product languished. Just because it was always, gotta, gotta just fix it, another percent, another percent, we'll make so much more money, another percent, another percent. And our product didn't move forward the way it needed to, as far as delivering end value to the end user. And I see a lot of parallels, uh, nobody in this room, but potentially other rooms, who aren't delivering to their users. Uh, this is the evolution um, as it's gone by. So none of these are my products. SimCity is my favorite game as a kid. Uh, they charged me, I don't know, 30, 40 bucks. I paid it. It was awesome. Spent 
hundreds of hours. Then the bird, he charged me 99 cents and I had a lot of fun. Then I started paying money and you know, they were really good at getting my money, but I, don't, I didn't have that same sense of joy I had underneath the SimCity regime. Uh, going forward, there's a new product out, uh, Amazon. Did anybody have Amazon Free Time Unlimited? No. All right, if you have, all right, a couple in the back. So this is a product where if you have kids, it's your babysitter. So for three bucks a month, Amazon will let your kid play as many apps and, and movies and books as they want. So it's all you can eat, games, videos for kids. So they limit the catalog to kids' titles, so that way you keep getting the whales that float the entire boat because you know, it's not ethical to make a kid a whale. Not that it doesn't happen. Uh, so this is their solution to making kids monetize. They're charging three bucks and then they create a content pool and they pay out the developers. But it's an added charge of three bucks a month that you have to pay Amazon. And there's similar parallels in Japan as far as pay for subscription gaming. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is we get a little bit self-centered in the gaming industry. Uh, we think that we're big deals. We have pirate ships that I showed you earlier. Uh, the TV guys actually are, are way richer than we are, and we forget that, I think. You know, we think, ah, oh, it's the age of the whale. I had this one guy who paid me 2,000 bucks. It was great. And the TV guys say, yeah, I have like 100 million people who pay me $5 a month. That's pretty cool, too. And so they have different mindsets around what's an appropriate amount of money to be making. And I think we've set the bar different position by saying, hey, mobile is 20 million, I'm sorry, 20 billion out of it. We're a tenth the size of the TV subscription market. Are people spending a tenth as, is your average human being, so move beyond Americans, is your average human being spending merely a tenth of his time on his mobile and the rest of the time on the subscription TV? No. Your Indonesian only has a handset. So how do we turn the handset entertainment into the same size business? I think that the value proposition for video games is compelling. You're touching it. It's interactive. You can tune it. When you sit back and watch your wife watch a Desperate Housewives, that's, I just feel there's less value there. And that we can move in with a great product and really capture that. This is what we're hearing from the carriers. Uh, so we talk to carriers, as I mentioned before, we have 300 different carriers we do business with around the world. And they tell us about their problems. So I don't know if anybody here is a carrier person, but this is what they think about at night. All right, great, I'm in a competitive thing. Who, how are they gonna pick me, my SIM out? And how are they gonna top me up at the stores? So your local kiosk, and they're fighting against their other competitor, and they're every day trying to win customers. And then, what's my customer acquisition cost? Okay, okay. And then, what's worse, once they get my, their SIM in the phone, the phones can accommodate multiple SIMs. That's awful. I think if I had multiple SIMs in my phone, AT&T might treat me a little nicer. But I signed a two-year agreement, so I guess I'm dead to them. Uh, you know, versus in Pakistan, let's say, they have three SIMs. And they have, as you walk around, they have price charts. And so they show you how much does minutes cost per, like, a gasoline. And they have changing prices, dynamic pricing. Very advanced stuff, doing load balancing, trying to get share. But also, as you make prices more transparent, your margins get crushed. And so they're in highly competitive markets. And they're thinking, oh, I just I'll roll all this money into a new data network. I just rolled out 3G, you know, a big thing other places. Or I have spotty 4G coverage. How do I get my users to actually use this data that's relatively expensive? And then, to make it all worse for the carriers, see how hard to let carriers' lives are? Uh, I'm not the default app store. So back in the day of, of walled gardens, I could just tell, said, hey, I'm, a, I'm the app store. I'm going to take half the walled garden with feature phone. They can't do that anymore. So Samsung's not going to just say, yeah, sure, I'll preload it. You're the fifth largest carrier in Vietnam. I'll absolutely do whatever you say. Nope, Samsung says, here's our global build. You're buying unlocked phones. And you know, Verizon's a different case. So don't look at your phone and say, well, I do have a Verizon app store. It's different in other countries. And so the carriers just can't force that. So you don't have the app store. You're worried about churn. You're worried about customer acquisition. This is what they care about. This is what we've been talking to them and they've actually brought to us, is they said, how can we use games to solve my, being the carrier's problems. How can we say, how do I acquire customers cheaper? How do I keep them from leaving me? 
how do I keep my SIM active all the time and not have them skip to the next providers who's half a cent cheaper, which people do now. And so the way to do that, they think, is with gaming. So the idea here is that you offer as part of your service. So right now, you have the conception of what my cell phone service is, is it's voice, it's data, it's texting. What if it was gaming was added to that? You know, you'd see that, and that's a retail value. So if you're a young man, uh, you're a waiter in Turkey, you make you know, kind of our equivalent of $100 a week, and you say, ah, cool, for my funding, I can either get a SIM that comes with gaming or get one that doesn't come with gaming. Or maybe the other one comes with Google Play. Will you pay more money? He says, oh, I think I'll take the one with, with gaming. He's tempted to switch out the prices because the other carrier is a little bit cheaper. I think I'll leave the gaming one active because I want to keep updating my character. So I see there being, and the carriers have told us, they want a tool to solve their problems. And I think if the gaming industry is able to move in and help the carriers, we can move beyond the current Google Play shareware universe and move towards subscription revenue. And that's where the numbers get really huge. So how do you turn this into subscription? The idea is basically moving their marketing around. So these are the same firms. My office is down by uh, AT&T Park. They spent a bunch of money making AT&T Park. As far as I know, that's not going to make me any less uh, excited about churning from AT&T. But if my AT&T subscription, and that wouldn't be AT&T, it'd become you know, my Telcel subscription, comes with gaming, I'm going to stick around, especially if I have a balance and I like getting the gaming. I'm accustomed to trying new apps and buying them because it's already in the store, so you don't have this don't want to pay to purchase, you can give it a shot, and you can start selling apps and really optimizing it. The other thing this does for the App Store is it enables the App Store to behave more like Netflix. So what does Netflix want? They want you to click on it and like the movies. What does Amazon want, and Google Play and Apple? They want you to spend money in the apps. So all Amazon wants, to, or Netflix, is make you happy, so you keep paying them money. Uh, the other ones are trying to think about how do I merchandise to you. So you move from a concept of merchandising to making the customers happy. And we think that that will help reduce churn, and this is what the carriers are asking us about executing on. So you're not going to see this tomorrow, but I wouldn't be surprised if you uh, saw it not in your local carrier uh, towards the end of next year. Any questions on that part? Clear as mud? I think every, all right, so let's take a quick vote. How many of you would be interested in putting your app into the content pool? Depends on the rev share. So going back, it's 3%. This is kind of the ballpark figure. But you're not talking 3% on just you know, 200 pesos. You're talking 3% on their book of business. So you're talking hundreds of $100 billion potential opportunity. 3%, that's not too shabby. And then the way it would work within your share is the same thing as Netflix or Spotify. So the a la carte models have been disrupted. The download model was disrupted by Spotify and Netflix. So if we think that this is not going to happen to us and we just wish away and hope that we're going to be a la carte forever and free to play, I think that that's the same sort of attitude that you saw out of prior business models on the internet that weren't delivering enough value for the customers. Short answer is it would be your, your share of your app usage. So if you have 1%, you'd take 1% of the content pool. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming to the session. Uh, if you have any questions and, and like more data on specific markets, I would be happy to share uh, market intelligence for you. So, Jake, I have enough pricing time in Mexico. Happy to send over data and help you out. Thank you very much.